it's nice to be here, and I see many friends in the audience. Um, and I see one man that I would like to salute particularly, um, James Buckley, the first man elected, I believe, in the history, the only man elected, only person elected, to the United States Senate as a capital C conservative. So, very honored to have you here, <laughs> Judge Buckley in the audience. Um, one of my observations over the years is that uh, success obscures difficulty and ultimately breeds failure. Uh, the long sustained intellectual and political success of the form of conservatism that we call fusionism, free market, cultural tradition, anti-communist. I think one of Judge Buckley's relatives had something to do with formulating this up in Sharon, Connecticut or someplace like that. Um, has obscured how difficult it is to foster a national conservatism in a nation founded in an act of revolution. And it's concealed for some time the tensions and strains uh, that have uh, fractured and torn apart fusionism in this era of Donald Trump. Um, the paradox of conservatism in a revolutionary nation has been noted uh, by others, and not least by my two, the two preceding speakers who have talked about uh, and helped us understand the legacy of, of American democracy in light of the thinking of Edmund Burke. Um, and it, it, but we also need to realize that um, this nation is now pretty old. Uh, as the uh, scholar of nationalism, Re Leah Greenfeld, has recently written, America's young society <clears throat> is nonetheless one of the oldest nations on earth and the only one without a pre-national history. But the founders, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, did have a history as Englishmen, as Britons, uh, and self-consciously uh, referenced as a justification for their rebellion. Uh, the philosopher John Locke, uh, thought then to be the contemporary theorist of what became known as the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89, about which I wrote a little book, um, but who, as the previous speaker indicated, um, as, and as historian Peter Laszlo has argued, was actually writing not to justify uh, a peaceful evolution like 1688, uh, but a revolutionary uprising some years earlier against King Charles II that didn't pan out. Um, so that's not exactly a conservative heritage. Uh, and yet by now it's ancient or at least antique. Uh, the first Congress assembled, as mentioned, 230 years ago. Uh, in time to, reach, uh, to be innocent of the news of the fall of the Bastille. Uh, the Supreme Court handed down Marbury versus Madison 216 years ago, the same year Congress admitted to the Union the first chunk of the slave-free Northwest Territory as the state of Ohio. Uh, our political parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, are the oldest and third oldest in the world, at least by my reckoning, with the British Conservative Party in second place, uh, if it's still existing. Um, the, uh, the Democratic Party dating, by my reference, to 1832, and the Republican Party from 1854. Not many American institutions, aside from churches, have had such a long and permanent existence. These, it's kind of uncanny uh, in some of the other uh, democratic systems, representative government systems, of course, parties change frequently. Uh, Israel is one such example, I think. But the, uh, the United States, they've stayed the same. Um, what I find hard to discern as I was thinking about this lecture and looking back on American political history is which sides of our party fights can really be called conservative. Uh, I note that uh, George Will's recently published book uh, is entitled The Conservative Sensibility. Uh, sensibility, not persuasion, not tradition, certainly not platform. Uh, the differences in America's party politics have typically uh, not been so much arguments between stasis and reform, though they're often phrased that way, but arguments about how to interpret the Constitution, how much uh, power in this country should be centralized in the federal government uh, or left devolved to the various uh, still sovereign states. Uh, so looking back, which one would be counted as conservative? The agrarian Thomas Jefferson or the mercantile Alexander Hamilton? 
Uh, Jefferson prevailed in elections, uh, but fell back on Hamiltonian reasoning to justify the Louisiana Purchase and some other policies that he decided to follow. Um, while John Marshall, with uh, a Hamiltonian essentially, established a centralized constitutional law. And which one should be clouded as conservative, Andrew Jackson or Henry Clay? Uh, Jackson paid down the national debt and abolished a central bank. Uh, and the young Arthur Schlesinger's attempt to depict him as an earlier incarnation of Franklin Roosevelt are unpersuasive. Uh, while Clay argued for a, for a central bank and a national public works program. But Jackson did send federal troops to the border of South Carolina when John C. Calhoun tried to nullify uh, federal law, and for once Clay heartily approved. Uh, and which one was more conservative, the protectionist and industry favoring William McKinley or the agrarian and inflationist William Jennings Bryan uh, and, and, and religious uh, traditional a follower of traditional religion. Neither of these statesmen or their followers fits easily into the category. We get on more familiar ground in the progressive era, the New Deal years. Uh, George Will frames his history of political sensibilities as a battle between those who followed Woodrow Wilson into ever greater centralization on supposedly rational principles and those who cherish the framers' constitutional framework allowing greater room for local adaptation, including both faithfulness to tradition and openness to Burkean reform. Uh, if we hop, skip, and jump to the New Deal years, and the wide, we get toward the widespread assumption that one of our historic parties is liberal, the other conservative. But things weren't so simple. Uh, the Democratic Party included almost all Southern segregationist office holders, as Joe Biden was kindly enough to recently uh, remind his fellow Democratic presidential candidates. Uh, Judge Buckley served with some of those uh, senators as well, and I'm sure he never snubbed them in any discourteous way. Um, the, uh, in, uh, in, you know, the, um, in, in the, uh, just a second, I'm a little out of sync here. Uh, both parties had isolationist and interventionist in the years before World War II, uh, and it was only the need to fight the communists that brought the will young William Buckley permanently into the interventionist cabinet, and it took him some time in the years after founding National Review to abjure racial segregation. Uh, in retrospect, the period of fusing party loyalty and ideological label lasted for just a generation of America's 200 plus years, uh, approximately from the inauguration of Ronald Reagan, 1981, uh, to the souring of many, including uh, William Buckley on the Iraq War in the last years before his death in 2008. Uh, political scientists in mid-century America lamented that we didn't have one liberal, clearly liberal, party and one clearly conservative party that were kind of a muddle, well, God answered their prayers for at least a while and uh, gave them that which, of course, they promptly went out lamenting about how the demise of liberal Republicans and uh, throwing out of conservative Democrats was a terrible thing for America. Um, it just tells you that uh, don't count on always following the advice of the political scientists. Um, the, uh, the fusionism that largely guided the policies of President Reagan, both President Bush's, uh, to Republican reformers like Newt Gingrich and Rudy Giuliani, Republican partisan pals like Trent Lott and Mitch McConnell, um, that when the Republican Party and conservatism seem to be pretty much on the same wavelength, uh, that tradition uh, right now I think is, uh, how shall I put this, in hibernation. Uh, so where do the conservative tradition of the Republican Party stand today? Does it stand, they stand for isolationism or interventionism, respectful of traditional religious precepts or inclined to laissez-faire on moral issues and different moral issues and different stances perhaps, uh, the supportive of free trade and welcoming of mass immigration or more inclined to protectionism and immigration restriction? Um, these are all questions raised or at least rendered far more visible and pressing uh, than they were previously by the nomination and election of Donald Trump 
uh, and by the almost unanimous approval he enjoys from the one-third of American voters who, are still, who still count them republic themselves as Republicans or have recently come to do so. Um, partisan politics, not cultural tradition, is my field of inquiry. And let me address these questions through the prism of party political history. Uh, and let's remember what fusionism inclined us to forget or overlook that people's opinions on economic, cultural, and foreign policy issues don't always fall into a single um, conservative on all three or liberal on all three category. The Almanac of American Politics, which was mentioned briefly, of which I'm a founding co-author, um, early on started distinguishing between members of Congress's uh, voting stance on economic, social, and cultural issues just because you had mixtures of points of view, uh, more in the 1970s than today, but nonetheless, those have become more important. Uh, so let, let, here, let me go back to an article uh, that I wrote for the spring 1993 issue of the, the late and lamented public interest. And I want to thank Yuval Levin for leaving it online since uh, the manuscript isn't in my files or anything. Um, and it, it was entitled, The Triumph of American Nationalism. Um, interesting title in light of our discussions today. Uh, in which I argue that over the long period of partisan democratic politics, uh, democratic, small d, republican, small r, uh, in, in nearly two centuries in, a, in the United States of America, we have seen four different kinds of political parties. Or to put it another way, successful political parties have embodied, have taken on in varying proportions four basic tendencies. There have been four major types of parties, I wrote. Religious, liberal, socialist, and nationalist, um, and wh which have provided, uh, which have provided what I called sustainable governance. Uh, let me quote myself at length because it's always a pleasant surprise when you go back to something you wrote 25 years ago to find that it mostly holds up today. Uh, it's this an experience I don't always have. Um, uh, I wrote, religious parties can work, but most countries in today's world either have no religions like secular Northern Europe or too many, the United States, for one to govern. Liberal parties have had much success, but have tended to disappear from failure of nerve. They do not believe in anything strongly enough to fight for it. Socialist parties have governed ably in some countries, uh, but alas, Socialism doesn't work, and socialist parties are fast disappearing. Uh, that leaves nationalist parties, not the nationalism of Hitler, of course, but the nationalism of Churchill, de Gaulle, Roosevelt, nationalism that is open to various economic programs and compatible with cultural toleration. Um, thus, the British Conservative Party started off in large part as a religious party, Church of England party. Uh, as Prime Minister Lord Salisbury used to read clergymen's sermons when deciding on the appointment of bishops, make sure they were sound uh, on, on theology. Uh, and uh, we still have religious parties in India, the world's largest democracy, just gave a record majority uh, to the heavily Hindu BJP P P party. Uh, in recent years, America's Republican Party has been for many and in many respects a religious party with religiously motivated opponents of abortion, supporting Donald Trump strongly uh, for his nominations for judgeships. Uh, and there's something uh, Mr. Trump has not, uh, has sort of delegated to Leonard Leo, Lord Salisbury's task of reading the judicial, potential judicial nominee's sermons uh, <laughs> for him and uh, to see whether or not they're sound on the faith. Uh, one might also see, if one wanted to be mischievous, uh, various uh, Democrats' response to supposed climate change um, as, care as having something of a religious character. We are told to have faith something will happen in the future. We have elaborate rituals of recycling and other things to remind us of our duty uh, to something larger than ourselves. Uh, and we even have the sale of indulgences in the form of carbon offsets for Al, <laughs> Al Gore's personal jet use. So uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is happy to pay for that. So uh, 
that's perhaps a partisan jaundiced explanation, but I think there's something to it. Uh, liberal parties have imploded from the Liberal Party of Britain, which went from a majority in 1906 to a poor third. Uh, Grover Cleveland's Democratic Party, he didn't even endorse Bryan for his own party's candidate for president when he was still leaving office. Uh, the, the liberal anti-clerical parties of Italy, Germany, and France, which fell uh, to Mussolini's mock army in 1922, or Hitler's very real one in 1940. Uh, as far as socialist parties, they're not all dead yet. Um, we have, we still have, we've got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's uh, squad active in the Democratic Party, taking on the arch-conservative Nancy Pelosi. Uh, <laughs> British labor leader Jeremy Corbyn is busy purging Jews uh, from his party and trying to, purporting to do so probably from his country. Uh, but we look in vain in the election results for very many big numbers for the social democratic parties of Germany, France, and Italy. Um, all this has been a subject of, uh, of concerned uh, conf uh, uh, comment. Uh, the Economist magazine came out recently against what it called reactionary nationalism, which apparently consists of refusing to let your government be run by the Europe undemocratic mandarins of the European Union uh, as some long-standing Burkean institution. Uh, I just have to say I'm not sure how long-standing it is. I can remember sitting in the gallery of the House of Commons in October 1971 listening to a stimulating debate, cross-party, on whether Britain should join what was then the European Economic Community. Uh, it's not exact, it doesn't go back to Magna Carta, uh, the, uh, that uh, sort of thing. Um, the, uh, in my view, history recent and remote provides a strong basis for Yoram Hazani's claim in the virtue of nationalism that the best political order that is known to us is an order of independent natural st national states. Um, and a nationalism, uh, the nationalism he has in mind, uh, comes about, as he and Greenfeld argue, in the, first in the 16th century in England and the Netherlands, those kind of seacoast fringe maritime uh, countries that develop a national consciousness. They also develop a tolerance for multiple religions that was pretty much unique in the Europe of the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. They develop ideas of natural rights and they keep in practice what are thought to be antique and outmoded institutions like par elective parliamentary representation uh, and independent courts. Uh, that kind of nationalism, it seems to me, is uh, a very vital and strong thing, and the nationalism, to the extent we have it in the United States, uh, strong today in the Republican Party of Donald Trump, sometimes uh, more elegantly expressed in his speech two years ago in Poland, and, his speech last month on D-Day than in some of his tweets. Um, and uh, that has been expressed many years by leaders of the Democratic Party, though quite a bit less so today, uh, is, uh, is, is, I think, provides a strong basis and a strong guide to where we should go for the future. Um, let me just conclude uh, by quoting uh, the uh, Charles Moore, the Daily Telegraph former editor, Brexit supporter, Margaret Thatcher biographer in a recent, uh, in a recent uh, column over the last week, which is relevant about Britain, but I think is very relevant to the United States as well. He says, the future of Britain uh, is not a choice between isolationist nationalism and the rules-based international order. It lies in a liberal order which restrains itself and anchors itself in the traditions culture and nation in which it operates. Liberal attitudes, in short, combined with conservative subtlety. Britain used to be good at that. Once we are free of Brussels, perhaps we can do so again. Sort of sounds like Edmund Burke, doesn't it? Thanks very much.